control theory. Perceptual control theory is a framework for understanding individual and collective behavior based on engineered control systems, for example, thermostats and cruise control. Cybernetics, the biological applications of control systems like homeostasis and systems thinking, holistic frameworks for scientific theories. So this is the whole body of knowledge of science, which is the other body of knowledge. So Heather was studying at uh, University of California in San Diego, and she came across this advertisement for the job to be the research, health research specialist with David's company. And even though it was after the deadline, she applied and she got the job. So David, who is the founder of NOD Apiary Products, which produces this Mitoway product uh, for getting rid of Veromite, he grew up in Hamilton, where his father worked in the steel mills, but he's always been interested in bees, even in high school. And also along the way, he encountered the Baha'i faith. And as a young man, he moved to the area where he now lives uh, to help the work there. And there he met his, his uh, lovely wife, Mary. And they have these three beautiful, beautiful daughters and umpteen grandchildren. I think it's seven or... Anyway, I'd I don't know. So that's it. David is a very original thinker. And uh, he, in 2006, he got the Agri-Food Excellence Award from the Premier of Ontario. And there you have it. He's got a super business, a wonderful plant, wonderful work, corporate culture. And there's the introduction. Thanks, Thanks Neil. Are we, are we ready for us to start? I think we're ready. I just wanted to uh, mention, um, uh, I'm not sure how you want to do this, Heather, if you'd like to have, you'd like to just go through your PowerPoint or if you'd like to have people ask questions in the chat as we're going through. Um, I think we had agreed before that people can ask us verbal questions and we're happy mm -hmm. to answer verbal questions. If there's someone who's watching the chat and maybe can draw attention to us, if someone is asking a question in the chat, that will work. But we're we we don't want to have to focus on reading what what's right. coming up in the chat. Right. So maybe we could ask people to raise their hand. We all know how to raise our hand with. Um... Yeah, as long as as long as someone's looking for it, because David okay. and I I know from okay. teaching lots of classes online oh, that I'll I never see it if someone raises their hand. So I understand. I understand. Thank you. Well, well, let's just ask people to raise their hand if they could, if they have a sure. question. Thank you. Okay, and okay. so I'm going to start sharing the screen, um, and we'll take it away. Maybe. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, so. Uh, Today, David and I are going, and David will begin, but I'll just introduce the, the talk here at the beginning. So uh, we're gonna be discussing the, or understanding the global impact of the European honeybee. We're gonna take you on a journey sort of from when humans started first using honeybees and the various reasons that they use them uh, through to the advent of some newer technology. And by new, I mean a few hundred years ago that really changed the face of how honeybees get integrated into our agricultural systems today discuss how that impacted um, apiculture, and then take us into a vision of the future. And again, we're questions along the way. Uh, okay. So uh, David, I guess this is you. Hey, thanks very much, Neil and, and Heather. Um, and also thank you uh, to the group for you know, giving up your afternoon or morning or evening, wherever you are on the planet to, to attend this presentation. Um, we like the honeybee so much. It's, uh, you know, the focus of our lives at this time to uh, keep honeybees healthy and the opportunity to share with the knowledgeable audience uh, what we do is a wonderful opportunity for us. And I'm looking forward to spending this time together. Um, so before the actual talk, I thought I would just sort of give an overview, um, 
background sort of statements about what we're doing. And so uh, working from the PowerPoint, uh, this presentation looks at issues facing our food security through the prism of humanity's relationship with the European honeybee. And I wanna point out that this is specifically the European honeybee. There's many honeybees, but this is the one that, uh, that has been moved around the world um, um, by Europeans essentially uh, at about 500 years ago. And this presentation is more of a supply side focus than a food systems focus, although we will touch on both. Um, like any talk of this nature, there is so much stuff we wanted to share. Um, and we left a lot on the cutting room floor, shall we say. Um, but whatever personal interests people have, we certainly welcome your comments and questions and inputs. Um, we see the journey of the honeybee as being reflective of humanity's relationship with each other. And we'll get into some details on that. And we see bees as having a special place in the world and focus on developing and providing sustainable honeybee health tools to beekeepers is what we're doing. And that, that's to the business that we're involved in. So that's not an academic exercise, it's an actual business of getting tools into beekeepers hands. And as mentioned, the topic is multifaceted and the sharing is circular in nature because one thing affects the other. Uh, comments and questions are welcome. So just to give the very big picture, um, food is a consumable that needs to be constantly replenished and there's no start and stop. We can't just set a reset button where we wanna be. We're, it's a part of a flow. Uh, just as our own species, we're urbanizing as never before. And there's a disconnect from primary production. To give an example, at the start of the Great Depression, approximately 65% of people were in, directly engaged in agriculture. And now I think in Canada, we're about 0.8%. So that's a huge change. So of course, along with this rural lifestyle is changing. Um, a lot of people that live in the country commute to works elsewhere or people that live on farms also have additional uh, off farm jobs. And so the lifestyle of, of how we go about um, uh, living is different. And historically, we, sort of had lifestyles of self-reliance and then we would share, trade or sell the excess. And that was the model for most of humanity until very recently. And then historically food supplies were the natural environment and they would be self-replenishing in some manner. And it was based on nomadic hunter gathering, open water fishing, mixed land farming, plants and animals, nomadic herding, there would be a slash and burn uh, methodology, the deforestation. And then when that land was, was spent, the, the, the tribal unit would move to a new area or there would be desert education. Whole civilizations have been documented. They used to live in desert areas that had complex uh, irrigation systems. And of course, there's the, the Nile Valley as, as known as one of the most uh, long run irrigation, desert irrigation systems. Most of society was wrapped up in primary food production. However, starvation often loomed. Next slide, please. Yeah, sometimes it's, uh, I'm pressing the button. Okay. Thanks. It's not advancing. <laughs> we'll see how many it jumps then. <laughs> yeah, it's going to go all at one time, I'm sure. There we go. Did it jump any? I don't think so. Um, no, we're good. No. So basically a question for the group. Um, what do earthworms, horses, and honeybees have in common? Does anyone want to take a stab at that? I see a uh, hand I, up. Yeah, I do. Because you, to you, you told us. Well, then you shouldn't answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good student. We had someone else with their hand up in the lower right there. I would say they support our local farms, our local agribusinesses. Definitely a huge impact on, on, uh, on the world around us. Um, I'll, I'll take us through it. Basically, these were things that were not part of the Americas and they came over with settlers. Hmm. So 
probably one of the least known impacts was the one of earthworms, which came over with potted plants. But they changed the whole soil uh, management system that was from a very slow decomposition to a very rapid uh, decomposition of organic matter into usable nutritional forms. And the forests that were supported uh, with the slow decomposition have been supplanted with ones that now thrive in rapid uh, composition changes. Of course, horses, um, they brought transportation. They, they were a power source. And so they changed how agriculture could be done and how people got around. And the other thing that came over was the European honeybees. They were introduced into, into the system all by settlers. So this is part of, of, of the movement of things around the planet by humans. So that's the answer to the question. Humans brought these things to, to, the, to the Americas. Next slide. Okay, so over the last 500 years, we've seen settlers and explorers and other people moving around the planet um, by various ways. And there's huge food sources exchanged and adopted. So for example, um, things like corn and potatoes uh, moved back to Europe and were adopted by them and over into the Americas. Uh, were brought a lot of the fruit and other crops that we grow here. But at the same time, there's some food displacement. What was primary food products grown here were replaced um, by uh, what was brought over and vice versa. And along with this, we came all introduced new pests and diseases. And this is an ongoing process. The other thing that's happened over the last 500 years is we've become very interconnected. So humanity is now being forced to function as a whole, but there are many legacy issues and a limited common, common vision. So a constant thing is people like this group that have the similar concerns, where do we turn to, to find solutions that can actually be implemented? We have lots of think tanks, but how do we put these things into action? Um, and then the other thing that's been huge over the last 500 years was transportation was limited. Your common person often uh, would be born and pass away very close geographically, same location. But now um, we move around very easily around the planet relatively. There's always going to be some barrier, but uh, we expect fresh fruit year round and relatively cheaply. Just to give an example, I, my wife and I went shopping and came home and were eating grapefruit that had been in Israel 10 days prior. So it's just, that's how quickly that uh, we, we move food around. And it was midwinter, you know, we have these expectations of this fresh fruit year round. And relatively cheaply, when we consider that, um, you know, we might think of it now in terms of how much money we spend on something, historically it might be seen how much time we spent to grow something. And it took a lot of human resources and time to produce our food. Although it may not have been assigned a cash value, it was certainly how much effort went into getting it. So compared to what effort it took to have food on our tables historically, it's a relatively cheap uh, thing. And it has freed up humanity to do many other things because we don't have to be so focused on, on producing food for our tables. The other thing that's really important at this time in history is land ownership. So historically, land ownership moved through generations or classes, especially the aristocracy or a caste system. And it was quite normal to have things like war, slavery, uh, which uh, these things would lead to tribute being paid. Of course, colonialism, territorial control um, was seen as how people would be okay to function. And then in the top down central planning decisions making models tested in the last century, of course, we know often led to widespread famine. So the whole decision making, how to use land, who owned land, who controlled land, who could afford land, all of these things are crucial to agriculture, of course, and how we feed ourselves. And, and we're in this very interesting time with that. The other thing is the actual work itself. So just to give a mental space, 
Um, there was sort of the pre-horse time. And then of course, when the horse came and we could have the plow and they did a lot of the work of, of the farm. And coming along with that uh, was storing of food for the horses and for other animals. Of course, our horses originally were used for nomadic work, you know, for, for herding. Uh, but then they started to be using on the land for growing crops. And now we have mechanization because of the fossil fuel and the internal combustion engine and moving quickly towards automation. If you go to a farm show now, and Neil probably has been to several, um, there's a lot about you know, automatic uh, milkers for cows or uh, how to use drones to assess the quality of the soil of your, of your fields. So you can determine what fertilizers to use, which crops to grow. So the historic stoop work by many has been changed to a mechanized living of a few. So this is all very high level, big picture stuff. <laughs> But science, you know, applied science and education. Historically, it was a, a, it was done vertically. You were born into a farm lifestyle or into a, a farming class, and you would get knowledge from your forebears. Well, now it's become more horizontal. You would go to a university, attend institutions, take classes, become educated in the science of farming. So farming is very much an applied science and how knowledge is transferred has changed a lot in the last uh, couple hundred years. So where do honeybees come in? So honeybees function at the crossroads. They're a livestock. A lot of people don't think of honeybees as a livestock, but they're a managed livestock. Uh, we have breeding programs. We, we look for certain characteristics. The genomes been mapped, have been mapped. Um, and it's very similar to a lot of other livestock. They're just very tiny. <laughs> um, and we do not, we do, but we don't typically eat this livestock. And the primary food that they produce for us comes from plants, but it's not a plant, which of course is honey. And the other thing is that they're tropical in nature, which we sort of humans are, you know, we have to pr protect ourselves from cold climates, but we can thrive in cold climates. Um, historically, bees were wildlife and did not care where, if where they live was provided by humans or was a cavity found. So we have to adapt ourselves to the bees. The bees don't really adapt themselves to us. Uh, unlike, say, for example, breeding dogs or other animals for specific purposes, that, that hasn't, uh, doesn't really work with bees. Their individual lives are short and they are committed to the needs and well-being of the whole colony. Now, Baby bees, people may, may not know this, but they actually are raised at the same temperature as our body temperature, about 35, 36 degrees Celsius. So um, it's a three week process for to raise a, a worker bee, which is about half to about half its working, half its working life. They live in the summer up to about six weeks as an adult bee, but they're already been three weeks as a baby bee. So the colony invests a lot in rearing its young, very much like humans. Like if you think of a human, you know, it takes 20 years to raise a human to adulthood, then, you know, they have their, their years. This is very similar ratio to what the honeybees have. So uh, baby bees are produced as sheltered and fed individuals. They're raised in the honeycomb. They start out three days as an egg, six days as a larva. Then they go through a pupating stage where uh, they, they weave themselves a cocoon and then they emerge as, as an adult bee. Uh, ready to serve the colony. And so even though they're raised as individuals like humans, yet the colony unit reproduces as a complex society. Do people know what a honeybee swarm is? If you have a sense of what I'm seeing some nods. So essentially you can reproduce the individual bee, but the question for nature is how do we reproduce the colony? So what they do is they will send out the colony, the host colony will send out a bunch of scout bees and they start looking for a suitable cavity to live. And then at some point there's a trigger where most of the adult bees of the colonies will fly out into the air, they'll be joined by the queen and then they'll, they'll settle on a, a, a point where they form a whole ball of bees. And at the center of this bees is roughly the, the queen. If you ever were to put your hand into the center of this cluster of bees, it's quite warm. Bees generate a lot of heat. 
and they take with them a lot of the stores of the colony. They have a honey crop and they have a stomach and they fill all these up with food and they're getting ready to start a new colony. So once they're hung on uh, typically in a tree or on, on some uh, surface, they'll send out even more scouts until somehow they come to a collective decision on where to set up a, their new home. And so this is already a very complex functioning society while they're still hanging in the tree. Once they've assessed potential new homes, then en masse, they'll again fill the air with bees, taking the queen with them, and they'll go and settle into this uh, new site. And all the food that they have absorbed with them starts their wax glands working. So they'll be ready to build the very comb, the, the comb that they'll be raising their, their family in. And as soon as there's a little bit of comb built, will start depositing some of that excess uh, food that they brought with them to give them some food reserves because honeybees are a hoarding insect and the queen will start laying eggs. But from the time they land until the first baby bee emerges, it takes about three weeks as discussed earlier. So it's a very complex system that's happening. And that's just to reproduce the colony. So the other thing that is very fascinating to me about bees is that they live in harmony with nature. When they go and they visit a flower, they're there to meet their own needs. They're looking for the nectar as a carbohydrate source and they're looking for the pollen as a protein source. But where they are doing this work, not only do they gather this food for themselves, but they're also doing a service to the plant. And Heather's gonna be talking about that. So we finally come up to what our actual talk is. So that was the introduction. And uh, Heather's already mentioned essentially what we're going to be discussing. Essentially, we'll look at the early use of the bees, the movement of bees around the planet, the discovery of pollination. You know, that wasn't an always a known science. It's actually fairly recent. Uh, movable frame hives, the discovery of the social structure and ecology, contributions to modern agriculture, threats to the honeybees, future vision, fun facts, and then questions and answers. So um, this is all very fascinating to me, and I hope that you enjoy the talk. <laughs> um, anyways, honeybees originated in North Africa and then spread to the Afrotropics, Europe, and Asia. And so we have this lovely graphic from uh, cave paintings that shows how honey was initially gathered. So hunter gathered, harvested from wild colonies. There was no attempt to actually keep bees and they were a source of food, medicine and other resources. And then of course they started having symbolic meanings. They were often found in religious scriptures. They may have been used to appease the gods, um, talked about in, uh, um, in different mythology uh, works as well and they started to achieve a, a cultural importance. We have to remember we're surrounded in a world now of readily available uh, sugar, <laughs> proteins, fats. Uh, honey as a concentrated sugar was highly valued. Like this was a rare thing um, to, for, to, to find in nature. So uh, it, uh, it, must, it, was, it was quite a, a highly valued commodity. So the earliest depiction of organized beekeeping was quite a long while ago, 4,470 years uh, in Egypt and possibly as much as 10,000 years ago. And it's just important to notice that you don't need land to keep bees. It's a type of agriculture where they don't graze in the sense that uh, um, uh, uh, say a horse or a sheep or goats or anything or a camel. Um, they would fly out to forage for food. And for, it was very common that women would be involved in beekeeping and, and the, or the priesthood or monks would, would be involved in beekeeping. And unfortunately, to harvest the high products, the bees would be killed because they didn't have a way of, or knowledge of how it works. And fairly early on, people had figured out that there was a single bee that was the you know, very important to the colony. And they referred to it as the king bee. And it wasn't until someone noticed that she was laying eggs that they decided to recall it the queen. <laughs> so we just imposed our own value that of 
course, it would have to be a male if there was the one and it was the head of the colony. But now we know that it was female and there is female. So this map gives a depiction of the global spread. So you can see the, the center part and then how it, how it spreads out to different parts of the world with the movement of people. So the crops that people worked with uh, in the past, for example, in, in uh, our part of the world, the native people would grow squash as one of their key uh, food ingredients, one of the three sisters, foods referred to as the three sisters. And there's a bee called the hoary squash bee, which was a native bee that co-evolved with that plant. And it would come into its maturity at the same time that the uh, uh, plant would come into uh, flower. So these things that co-evolved are, are part of the bee's interaction with the plant world. And to give another example, uh, we have apples. Apples co-evolved with the honeybee and uh, honeybees are key. And if you don't have a honeybee, you're not gonna get an almond. The almond nut is reliant upon the honeybee to provide pollination services. Um, but that's not why people were moving them around the world. They were taking them around the world just to supply the, the sweet and the wax for candles and the honey for medicines commonly used on wounds. Uh, and also uh, uh, because of the relig religious significance. And for many, many years, the Roman Catholic Church would only burn pure beeswax candles as, as a tribute to, uh, to uh, the, the importance of, of the honeybee uh, with the biblical context. But it should also be noted that for much of the world, honeybees are an invasive species. Well, they, they have an impact on the ecosystems that they enter. They're highly effective pollinators. Uh, if it's a plant that's suitable for their use, they will often strip out the pollen before the native bees have a chance to get to it. And, uh, it, and unfortunately, that's also reflective of colonialism. It's, uh, it's sad to say, but uh, the honeybees and humanity sort of you know, have gone hand in hand in this process uh, as we've moved around. So, uh, so as David was saying, when people were moving around honeybees, they were doing it primarily to have a source of honey, to have a source of wax and other um, products that were coming from the hive. And inadvertently, we were also moving around our agriculture at the same time, that wasn't inadvertent, but inadvertent was the, the mo movement of the agriculture with the bees. But it was actually not until 1793 that anyone figured out that bees and agriculture were connected because prior to that, we didn't understand pollination. Uh, and I know that a lot of people talk about pollinators and pollination, and I'm not sure that everyone always understands what that actually entails. So of course, pollination um, is the means of reproduction for plants, at least flowering plants. And oftentimes, although not always, that's facilitated by the movement of pollen from one plant to another, by some third party. And oftentimes that is an insect and often, oftentimes that is a bee. Um, and how does pollination actually work? Well, uh, in, in this picture here, I don't think, can people see my cursor when I'm moving it around the screen? No, okay. Yes. yes. Uh, well, you can see it, okay. I can see it, yeah. On the, on the left-hand side, we've got a picture and there's a little window. Um, and what that, that structure is called an anther. And on top of the anther, the anther generates pollen grains. And a pollen grain is actually kind of a complex structure. It's a, it's a structure that contains a few different cell types. The primary ones are these uh, cells called tube cells. And then there are sperm cells within there. Um, just like other kinds of sexual reproduction, it involves a sperm and an egg. Same thing for plants. But unlike for animals, the, the sperm cannot move on their own. So it's something has to transport these things. So these pollen grains contain these different cell types and they're coated in a covering called sporopollenin, which prevents them from drying out. Um, these pollen grains are also usually charged electric electrically. So they'll stick to the body of especially a hairy insect. So a bee gets close to there. Um, bees are like, as even mentioned earlier, collecting pollen for their own purposes. And that's because it's a protein source. 
but as they get close to there to collect pollen for their own purposes, the pollen is sticking to various areas of their body. Bumblebees, uh, you, can, you can see this especially, they get covered in pollen. Uh, and then as they're visiting different flowers, they're removing pollen from one flower and depositing it on this right-hand structure here, which is the pistil, the female aspect of a flower, a different flower. So the pollen grain gets deposited on the end here. It's kind of sticky usually, and it fuses with the membrane there. And when that happens, the sporopollenin covering opens up and the tube cells can now contact the pistil. And what happens then is they begin to grow. So the tube cell will grow and form this pollen tube down to the ovary of the plant. Once the pollen tube is fully formed, then the sperm cells travel actually down there, can contact the egg, and it's just regular fertilization from, from there on in. But as I said, nobody understood that this was actually what was happening for bees until 1793, which seems really late. So it's, it's really uh, sort of serendipitous that we were moving bees and our, our uh, plant-based agriculture around at the same time. Um, and it turned out to have worked out really well. So as David mentioned, honeybees are actually invasive in many parts of the world. That's not necessarily bad news for the, the local species, by the way. It depends on what their specific ecology is. But honeybees are what's known as a super generalist forager. That means that honeybees are effective pollinators uh, and effective foragers of a wide diversity of plants, whereas a lot of other species are tightly co-evolved with a, the single or, or a small range of species, honeybees are able to uh, forage from and also disperse uh, pollen across a wide range of plants. And just uh, before I move on here, the last thing I wanted to mention, so honeybees are, are collecting pollen for their own purposes to serve as a protein source, but there's lots of pollen on these plants and you only need a few grains to make it to the female aspect of another flower for, for pollination to actually occur. Once that happens, uh, and then essentially the, the outer edges of, these, of the ovary uh, begin to develop and that's actually what the fruit is. So if you've got an apple that gets pollinated and this means um, the fruit is actually the walls of the ovary. And uh, so that's how that works. And nectar, just as a final point, is the flower's means of attracting pollinators to come in. So the, the nectar doesn't actually, isn't actually involved in pollination specifically, but it's a means of attracting pollinators to come in and contact these pollen grains. So this, this is an interesting figure in our, in our history. This, uh, this person, John Chapman, came to be known as Johnny Appleseed. And he lived from 1774 to 1885. And he, was, he spread apples through the Northeastern USA and up here into Ontario. So he just was an early conservationist, uh, you know, according to the record, uh, a very sociable fellow. And uh, he just was into uh, propagating apples throughout, you know, his fascination and, and, and did this. And he was highly regarded in his time. And there's actually a museum to him uh, in Urbana, Ohio. So I just thought we'd, we'd throw in this, you know, humans are very active uh, bringing this, this agriculture, that plant that we now know quite well uh, and establishing it in, in, our, in our region alongside the honeybees uh, that were happening to be providing pollination. So along with what we've talked about before, the, the bees will live in any cavity that they deem appropriate for their purposes. And they're very good at it. There's been whole textbooks written on how honeybee scouts can, uh, you know, assess the suitability of a specific cavity for, for where to set up housekeeping. Typically, we might see them in a, a bee tree and uh, uh, where a center core of a tree is rotted out and it's got a crack that uh, allows the honeybees entry. But they can be found in, uh, in walls of buildings, uh, sometimes people have opened their mailbox and found out that a honeybee swarm has taken up a home and uh, they, uh, or I've even found one, one uh, at one point, uh, I was asked to remove one from a well casting. It was, uh, uh, they had actually gone underground, which is highly unusual for them because usually they like to be aerial up in the air. 
Um, and the, the wood of a, of a hive of a, in the tree trunk actually provides some pretty good natural insulation against winter in our climate. And also uh, from some predators such as skunks that like to go and knock on the front door of a hive. And then when the bees come up to investigate what's going on, smack them with their little paws and eat them. So uh, I often find signs that skunks have visited my hives in the bee yards and enjoyed the midnight snack. But anyways, people are learning about bees. Um, and so there was a Reverend Lorenzo Langstroth that in his observations of bees, he noticed that they consistently left a space uh, between their combs. Even if the combs would take different shapes and move in different directions, there was a space that the bees would always leave that uh, when he measured it, turns out to be the height of a honeybee. So that came to be known as the bee space and he built it into a design where he would put the comb, the honeybee comb into a movable frame. And that it's now illegal to keep bees in anything except a movable frame hive because it allows us to inspect and evaluate and deal with any disease or concern. So in 1852, he filed for a patent. There were some other thinkers at the time that he was engaged with and uh, sort of two main styles of hives have come out, the Dadant and the Langstroth that are now used around much of the world. But uh, Europe's long history and interaction with the honeybees means there's a lot of different designs. I think there's over 150 registered designs in Europe. But in North America, it was sort of a fresh start and most people have adopted the Langstroth design. Um, and this whole ability to, to, you know, to examine the colony and find out what was going on led to a whole bunch of improvements in, in how we keep honeybees. Uh, we can, their welfare, our, our awareness of diseases that they're dealing with, basic understanding of biology. And of course, something else it led to was we could efficiently produce honey, which means we could we created the industrial model that we have today, standardized equipment for, for processing and for handling hives and exchange between beekeepers is very easily done with the modern hive. And uh, the, this revolution in hive design really ushered in a, a vast wave of understanding of how honeybees operate. Everything from their social behavior uh, down to the molecular and chemical interactions that are happening uh, physiologically. And this is sort of what I've been studying for the past seven years of my life at UCSD is the communication of honeybees. And I'm just going to very briefly tell you about one uh, really amazing communication system that they have. Uh, probably most of you have heard of the waggle dance or the fact that bees communicate using dances. And even though it's recorded as far back as Aristotle of people noticing that bees made these strange movements. Nobody knew what they meant until Carl von Frisch came around and decoded um, these signals in the 1920s. So people had seen this behavior for thousands of years at least. Uh, nobody figured it out till Carl von Frisch. And it turns out that a ton of honeybee communication, what holds their society together, what allows them to operate in these gigantic colonies is actually based on these, what are called vibrational signals. So honeybees don't hear things the way that we do. They actually listen to vibrations mostly through their legs. And a lot of these signals, even though they look like dances to us, the important aspect for a bee is actually the vibration that they make. And on the left-hand side here, I've got a little drawing. Uh, it's, it's a little, I'm not gonna explain it in detail, but essentially how a couple of these signals operate. So we've got the waggle dance, the waggle dance looks like, if you see this, this bee here in the middle and then she's got the zigzag line going through her, um, you'll see bees on the surface of the comb and they'll sort of walk forward and wiggle their butt at the same time. Then they'll stop and they'll turn around one direction or the other and kind of go back to the beginning of that, of that uh, what's called a waggle run uh, and start again. And they'll repeat this behavior over and over. And each time they get to the end, they turn the opposite way to the, to the time before. So it ends up looking like a figure eight. This is the thing that Aristotle had, had observed for thousands of, year, or thousands of years ago that Carl von Frisch figured out. And what this actually does is it communicates to the other members of the hive where a good food resource is. So where a good patch of flowers with lots of nectar and or lots of pollen are. Uh, it can indicate other kinds of resources. David mentioned swarming before. So when honeybees are looking for a new home, they also use the waggle dance to tell each other where these 
potential new homes can be. So that's what Carl von Frisch figured out, the waggle dance. And it turns out that, that, that it's much more complicated than even this. First of all, the waggle dance is amazing because this is the first instance of what's called referential communication, where we have animals that are able to talk to each other about something that's not immediately in front of them. This is the first evidence that we have of that occurring outside of uh, vertebrates, really, in the insect world. Um, and nobody really has discovered anything like this since then. So the honeybees are pretty amazing in that sense. They have a very tiny brain relative to us. So we've got this waggle dance where they can tell each other where food is or where a good resource is. But um, as I mentioned, it's even more complicated than that. There's this other signal called a stop signal. And the stop signal looks like another bee. So we've got this bee with the S on her down here on the bottom right-hand side and a bee with a W. The W stands for the waggle dance uh, and an S is a stop signaler. So a bee will come in and headbutt a waggle dancer and it will cause her to pause just very briefly. And a lot of times when she does that, she doesn't resume waggle dancing. So the effect of that is that she's no longer telling anyone else where to find a resource. Why the heck would they ever do that? So this is called the stop signal because it makes the waggle dancer stop. Why would they ever do that? Well, it turns out there's a couple of reasons that we know of. One is if the, the flower patch that was being advertised by that waggle dance has now maybe like a predator on it, a spider or something has, has come along, if a bee visits that flower patch and she sees the spider, um, she can come back to the colony and, and find others who are advertising that spot and say, stop, stop telling everyone to go there because it's bad now. There's a predator, you know, not all that information, but she just says stop. Another reason that she might use the stop signal is because that resource has now become crowded. So honeybee colonies, especially large honeybee colonies, want to optimize how they're foraging for food. One of the big reasons why honeybees have been so successful and so successfully introduced everywhere is because of this complex system of communication that they have that allows them to take absolute advantage of whatever resources are in the environment. And they can flexibly shift as resources are sort of coming online or going offline as they become exhausted throughout the day. So nectar um, resources can, can be exhausted throughout the day, same thing with pollen. So honeybees are able to use signals like this, and there are many more that we barely understand of these vibrational signals. Uh, we've identified many of them, but we don't know necessarily what they're communicating with them that help them to fine tune uh, responses in, in this respect, probably, but we don't actually fully understand what they're doing. Um, the other main way that honeybees communicate with one another is chemical communication. So probably most of you have heard about pheromones, um, if you're a beekeeper, you've certainly heard about queen pheromone. So queen pheromone is actually a, a really complicated mix of about 20 different chemicals. Uh, and it, it's actually produced by a number of different glands on the, on the queen's body. Um, and this is a highly attractive pheromone that has a number of different functions, depending on what's actually happening specifically in the colony at the time. But at the very least, it's very attractive to the workers. And so you can actually buy artificial queen pheromone um, that will that will allow you to attract workers to various locations for for various reasons. Um, another big one for honeybees is the alarm pheromone, and this is if you handle a colony roughly, or if there's danger to a colony, and especially if anyone if any of the bees have stung, they give off the smell that smells like either like pledge or it smells like bananas. Um, and the signal that's produced there is it tells everyone else that the colony is under attack, so everyone should become defensive. So as that smell spreads, basically more bees become defensive. So that's an alarm pheromone. Uh, there are a whole bunch of a really complicated suite of chemicals that, that have so far been identified operating in, in the colony. So everything from brood give off certain pheromones that, and they give them off differently at different points in their lives that attract the nurse bees that look after them to come uh, feed them or, or care for them in, in other ways. And this changes as they develop. So lots and lots of this stuff has been discovered and basically the social structure, and there are other ways that they communicate with each other as well, but these are the two main ones. So the vibrational signals, the dances and the chemicals, the pheromones, um, all of this allows them to have this really complicated social structure to the extent and it's not just that, it's actually also the reproductive system that allows them to be what we call a superorganism. So as David mentioned, the reproduction of the colony, it's not just about individual bees reproducing, it's about the colony reproducing. So those swarms coming off and starting new colonies. 
Um, honeybee colonies really operate kind of like uh, an organism unto themselves. So there are individual bees in there. It's kind of like the individual cells within an organism. They all kind of work together in the service of that larger organism and a honeybee colony can be thought of in the same way. The advent of these movable frame hives allowed us to understand all this, all this uh, nuance. And then beyond that, so that's social systems, but the social systems are based on the honeybee biology and ecology. So the actual physiology of the bee, how does the bee actually work at a chemical or molecular level and having these movable frame hives again, and also um, observation hives, which is a, a variant of the movable frame hive where the, the, the frames are stacked on top of one another, giving you a big observable surface, uh, have allowed us to, to understand this. And then the development of laboratory techniques, such as this one that's depicted here on the left. This is an experiment that I ran a few years ago um, I, am, I have actually trained a bee to respond in a particular way. You might not think of these as being avid learners, but I have lots of instances where I was doing this. What this is, is a little micro pipette with some sucrose, some sugar solution on it. Bees taste through their antennae. So you, uh, you contact the antennae with this sugar solution and it makes them stick out their tongue because they want to have a drink of that sucrose solution. And you can pair that with a smell or with a sound uh, or with a, well, with a vibration. Here we paired it with a smell so that every time we gave this bee a taste of sugar, we also blasted a smell. And in our case, it was a, a duraniol or linalool, which are uh, chemicals that come from flowers. Um, and after a little while, and some of them actually learned it really quickly, as soon as you gave them that smell, which normally wouldn't make them stick out their tongue, they would stick out their tongue. So that's classical conditioning of something called the honeybee proboscis extension response. The proboscis is their tongue. Um, and I did this all in the context of learning about how exposure to pesticides, we've, we've probably, uh, most of us have heard about uh, neonicotinoids or neonicotinoids, and uh, or, or at the very least pesticides and how they're harming honeybees while well, I was investigating a new class of chemicals to see if it actually affected their ability to learn. Um, it turned out that it actually didn't, but that was just one chemical that we had investigated. So the development of all this technology has allowed for us to understand bees at a much deeper level. So we understand things like we never knew before what the life cycle of a honeybee was. The different casts within a honeybee colony, which the casts are the males, the worker females and then the queen, those are the three different casts. Within the workers, which are all females, we have what's called polyethism. They do different jobs and it's not just polyethism, they have age-related polyethism, which means that as they develop, as they become older, their jobs change. So we never knew that until we had these different kinds of, of hives to study them. The physiology, as I mentioned, um, understanding how a bee actually works at a mechanical level. Um, we can understand colonies at a much larger scale. So the homeostatic regulation of colony parameters. Most of us probably understand things like uh, inside your body. So your blood glucose level, for instance, is kept at a constant uh, rate as long as you're a, a healthy uh, person. Your, your, the oxygen level in your blood is, is kept at a, at a constant rate. That's called homeostasis. It turns out that honeybee colonies regulate things inside their colony in a very similar way. So the amount of food being stored, um, the amount of food coming in, how resources are directed and changed as a function of what's happening in the environment and what's happening inside their colony. All that stuff is shifting all the time, uh, but there are certain things that are really important for them to maintain in order for them to survive. And so they have to flexibly react to whatever's happening. And so they, they do this and we understand a bit about how that works. And so they're able to regulate the, also things like temperature inside their hive. Dave was, David was talking about how a honeybee brood develop at a temperature very close to our, our body range. Well, the temperature inside of a, a colony, especially for a cold-blooded animal like a bee, isn't necessarily going to be at you know, body temperature range. And, and how do they do that? It turns out that if they vibrate their flight muscles, they're able to generate heat. So even though they're not warm-blooded, um, they're able to generate heat um, outside their body by, by basically moving their muscles. We've learned things about their cognitive and sensory capacities. So things about how honeybees learn. And that's what I talked about in this, in this experiment here on the left. 
And discoveries are ongoing all the time. Every year, thousands of papers are published on things that we learn about the basic biology and ecology of honeybees. There's so much more to learn. So, wow, everyone, <laughs> how are you doing? That was a lot of information. Everyone still with us? Great. Heather, that was amazing. I, I, every time we talk, I keep learning yeah, more, we do. picking up more. Um, so I, I thought maybe at this time we might just take a little mental break before we plunge in. So I, I have a little riddle for, for the group. Um, so the riddle goes like this. And this is an appreciation of all that we've just learned. If, if a bee is in your hand, imagine you're holding a bee in your hand. If there's a bee in your hand, what is in your eye? Do you want to think about that? We could continue with the talk. Beauty. Pardon? Beauty. That's right. <laughs> Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So mental break over. We're gonna plunge right back in. Wow. So we thought we'd we'd put a little time into how honeybee affects our food systems. And this is an advertisement that was put out by the Soybean Growers Association. On my screen, I can't read the the, the country, but I think it's a country in in South America. It's Brazil. Uh, Brazil, thank you. So basically, um, they, they have this advertising that highlights the value of the bee to the soya bean plant. Um, so that I won't read through the numbers, but you can follow the bee on her flight as she, she, she increases the soybean crops. And soybean has become a major uh, food crop because it's so elastic. It's used in many things that we eat part of the industrial agriculture model as well as being eaten directly. Um, but the honeybees uh, has a huge impact on, on the amount of food that humanity is able to produce. Um, at this point in time, um, when I started in beekeeping, the whole focus was on getting a honey crop. But over the 40 years, 50 years almost now that I've been involved in beekeeping, um, over half of a beekeeper's income in, in North America is now based on being paid for providing pollination services. Because it's realized that if you don't bring um, honeybees to the crops to pollinate them at the time that they're in bloom, and this is that part of that circular learning where Heather explained the importance of, of plant pollination and insects involvement in it. There's so many, so much crop would be lost. So out in the prairies where the canola is growing, the beekeepers are paid to bring their bees to the canola seed plants because most Canada produces most of the canola seed for the, it's known as rape over in Europe, but that seed is set in, in Canada and harvested in Canada and goes around the world. Um, these, these are all things that a lot of people, when they think of bees, may not recognize that the value that they bring both to the industry, the beekeeping industry itself, and then to humanity's food supply is mostly through pollination. Um, David, we have a question here. Sure. Um, <clears throat> this is from Nivea. <clears throat> it says, could it be dangerous to share widely to ill-intentioned novices information of how to manipulate and condition honeybees responses to sugar solution, given their importance to our ecosystem? Is there evidence of human exploitation that's causing the disappearance of bees? Heather, do you want to take that one? You're muted at the moment. Yeah, there, then sort it out. Um, I would say that that if people have the time and patience to to to, to classically condition bees uh, to respond to anything, um, it, whether or not I share that information with them is probably going to be beside the point. It's it's not an easy thing to classically condition a bee, and uh, so if you saw on this slide here, let me just go back here. Uh, this bee is is harnessed in a container. This is actually the end of something called an Eppendorf tube. 
that I've cut the end off of and then I've modified a straw and I've pushed this bee in here and I had to, I had to actually anesthetize her to get her in here. Uh, you, can't, you can't just do this stuff not easily. Um, you know, it is, it, you'd need specialized lab equipment to do it. Now, could you train bees to go to sugar sources? Yeah, you could do that. Um, and people do that. And people inadvertently do that. Like bees will forage from any sugar source. In fact, there's a, a pretty famous case of bees foraging from an M&M factory and then people ended up with blue honey uh, because they were taking food from there. Um, I don't think that that's probably a major concern. I think that there are much bigger concerns for bees than if they end up foraging at some weird sugar source. I mean, we should try to avoid that as much as possible. But I think that some of these things that I'm gonna talk about here on this slide, the threats to the honeybees, much bigger concerns. And one of them is the, is the concern that we address specifically at Nod, which is fighting this mite that infests honeybees, Varroa mites. Even things like exposure to pesticides, uh, much bigger threat than, than people learning about sugar. I don't, did, did, uh, I'm not sure if that answered the question. So the other the follow up, she has a follow up here. What about politically? Could the science be used to prevent food growth in certain areas of the world? The science of classically conditioning bees? Not sure. She's. I, I don't know how. I'm, I'm not sure what she's what she's getting at. Yeah. Maybe we could move on, Heather. Just yeah, sure. Uh, manipulating their response to prevent pollination. Uh, I I think that you'd have to put a lot of effort in to stop bees from doing pollination. Uh, so, as as we mentioned, bees are, are attracted to pollen because it's a protein source, and nectar because it's a carbohydrate source. So th there are bees within the colony that are attracted to those things specifically. So some bees are nectar foragers, and some bees are pollen foragers. Um, if you had a, a bee colony and, and colonies need both of those things, if you don't have both of those things, in particular protein, the colony will die. Uh, so protein is required to produce the next generation. You can't grow baby bees without protein. So essentially, if you were able to somehow raise a colony of bees that, that never ate protein, the colony would, would die out. Um, I, I think it's very unlikely that we would get to that, to that point. We can talk about it some more later though. So just very briefly, challenges, uh, threats that honeybees face. So as I mentioned, disease. Uh, varroa is, is this one that probably most of us have heard about at some point, especially in the news cycle now. So there's been a, seems to be a, a, a larger number of colony losses, although I'm not sure that we have all the data on that yet this year. And a lot of people are attributing that to varroa. And varroa is this it mite, and we've got a picture here on the, on the right-hand side. It's quite a large parasite and it's a new parasite for the Western honeybee. So it actually only hopped over from um, the species that it co-evolved with is a closely related species called the Asian honeybee. And it only hopped over less than hundred years ago, which is very, it's a flash in the pan for, from an evolutionary time point. So our Western honeybees haven't had a chance to adapt to it at all. It's native host, the Asian honeybee actually uh, doesn't really see much in terms of serious consequences of varroa infestation. They've sort of learned to live with them, but we're far from that with our with the honeybees and they're calling, causing significant problems uh, if for no other reason, and there are other reasons, but one of the main reasons that they're causing problems is because they vector viruses. So honeybees always had viruses, but varroa are able to transmit them and concentrate them to a level that hadn't been seen before. So viruses are problematic. We have no treatment for, for honeybee viruses. All we can do is treat the varroa, try to, try to uh, minimize the amount of varroa. And so that's what uh, David and I work on at Nod is developing uh, medicines to treat varroa. So that's a challenge. And, and some, of the, some of the disease aspect of honeybees it actually is as a function of, of uh, large scale agriculture and apiculture. So when you have lots and lots of honeybees in one area, the opportunity for disease transmission, especially if you're not handling them properly, is amplified uh, exponentially. So, and that we see that with, with all kinds of agriculture, anytime that animals are kept in high densities, uh, the opportunity for disease to, to spread. Uh, we see this with humans as well. I mean, humans have all these crowd diseases that historically we didn't have because we didn't live in the densities that we live in now. 
Another challenge for honeybees is pesticides. Um, people have been working hard, chemical companies have been working hard to develop pesticides that are nicer to bees. But at the end of the day, it's really hard to develop a pesticide that's going to facilitate the growth of a crop that targets one species of insect while leaving another species of insect completely unharmed. I mean, insects are insects, they have commonalities. So something that kills um, a hemipteran, a, a sucking insect on, on, on a crop um, is very likely to also kill honeybees. So what, you, what you're gonna try to do, and, and this is what chemical companies have tried to do, is try to engineer um, pesticides that don't get picked up by bees as much. Uh, and they thought they had sort of achieved something with the neonicotinoids because these are now not being sprayed as much. They, they tend to be seed treatments. So that means that they're systemic treatments. They're infused in the tissues of the plants. Um, but then it turns out that there are these off-target effects and they're probably uh, combining with other types of, of pesticides, especially fungicides to produce negative effects on honeybees. Um, but if you compare the impact of disease, especially things like varroa and the impact of pesticides, uh, I think the evidence is now suggesting that, that the effect of disease is still greater than whatever's happening with pesticides. I'm not saying that pesticides are, are good, but the, the, the potential for disease to cause problems is larger. There's also the issues of climate change. So as climate changes, uh, agricultural practices are changing, you know, how honeybees are kept are, are changing as, as there's more extreme weather events, you know, threats, specific threats to hives um, are, are occurring. So there's climate change and then changing of temperatures over winter, changing the disease landscape as well. Uh, on top of all that, and we've known this for quite some time, uh, monoculture agriculture is, is actually a threat to honeybees as we learn more about honeybee nutrition. We learn that honeybees that are foraging on a single crop alone, oftentimes that is not giving them a diverse enough diet for them to be truly healthy. So having healthy honeybees to begin with will allow them to better fight diseases. So all these things are connected. Um, and then of course, increased urbanization. A lot of people wonder about that. So um, we've got human fears to overcome. So humans uh, need to, to, to learn that living by honeybees, especially in the Northern climates, um, where our honeybees tend to be nicer, uh, you know, is not usually problematic, but, but a lot of people are, are afraid of honeybees, but laws are changing. So people are now able to keep honeybees in city limits in a lot of places. Um, and people wonder about that. So honeybees living in, in urban areas, maybe they're more exposed to various pesticides. And sometimes that's true, but it actually turns out uh, some research is showing that Honeybees that live in urban areas are actually healthier, and that's because they aren't exposed to the monoculture agriculture. They actually get a diverse diet. So, from a dietary standpoint, um, urbanized honeybees, you know, sometimes tend to do better. So, learning to keep honeybees in a more urban environment, so that that's a different set of skills than keeping them in a giant yard that's isolated, uh, keeping them on a rooftop or in your backyard or whatever. Um, so we, these are things that are, that can be threats to honeybees, but they're also opportunities as well. So we, we've come to the point in the presentation, we are nearing the end people, so hang in there. <laughs> so, uh, we're, we're looking towards the future a little bit and the things that, uh, Heather had talked about with the varroa mite having come from another species, Apis serrana. Sometimes people say, well, why wouldn't you just keep Apis serrana here in Canada? It's because they don't have the ability to overwinter. They, they have a different, uh, uh, we can't, crop, they, they're diff they can't crossbreed. We can't develop re varroa resistance that way. Um, so we're, we're trying many other programs, but so far after 100 years, we haven't had any success in breeding a European honeybee that can self-reliant against the varroa mites. But there's other invasive species. There's a, a tropolalaps mite, which is of significance uh, of the honeybee, and it is now moving out as well. And then you may have heard about the murder hornets that have uh, taken over parts of, of France and Belgium and uh, other parts of Southern Europe, which were then uh, last couple of years discovered in the Vancouver area and then down into Washington State as well. And these are 
a hornet that's very large and they prey on honeybee colonies as a principal source of food and nutrition to a point where they will wipe them out. And it's a serious challenge. Um, and, and we're working with people in Europe already trying to, to figure out a, a proper bait trap for trying to control the, the wild population of, of these hornets. And this is part of globalization. Basically, anything that can live within an ecosystem, humans are likely to introduce it to that ecosystem at some point. And then if it thrives, it will, it will shoulder its way in and somehow um, become part of it. Um, and so, for example, with the honeybee that's now been moved around the world, it's highly unlikely that the parts it's moved to will ever be without honeybees. Like they're they are now part of it, sort of like us European us of European heritage that are now you know in in other parts of the world. It's we're here now. It's uh, it's you know it, it, it's a very big question. Um, David, we so have a question. Sure. Did someone raise their hand? Uh, Geraldine. Yes, hi. I was trying to actually put it in the chat, but because oh. I, but no, I wasn't able to because I can I have difficulty moving from direct message to chat to okay. all. Okay. Anyway, so the, 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 the question is, um, in terms of are there ways of, um, if the timing of spraying pesticides, can that decrease the risk of major exposure to bees? Have there you know, has, has there been much work done in that regard for in terms of how farmers might time the spraying yeah. of pesticides? Yeah. There has been a lot of work on that and the labels developed are quite um, direct as far as optimal time for applying of pesticides. Um, methods of application, of course, vary. Um, I've, been, I've sat on many committees that, have, that, that work with this. For a while here in Ontario, we had a phone tree that if uh, a commercial sprayer was going to be doing, say, an aerial application of a certain crop, that they'd have to give us advance notice. And then we would go and cover all our beehives with burlap and then soak that burlap down with water and attempt to you know, keep them out of contact. Because the half-life of a lot of these pesticides is quite short. Once they've been exposed to sunlight and, and the, you, know, you know, they'll break down fairly quickly or rain. So typically, if you could keep your colony uh, population contained for, for a day or so, you would prevent a lot of the damage. Um, so just on a personal level, as a commercial beekeeper, I've walked into my bee yard after a pesticide uh, event where the all the population of the hives is pretty well disgorged from the hives. The, the bees are on the ground uh, dying. Um, the, the stench is quite interesting and uh, uh, disgusting. Um, a lot of them are, are in throes or if they haven't already died. And uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to place blame on, on, you know, to find out who actually did this because of course the, the bees will fly out in about a two, two mile radius around their colonies. Um, we, we were, as an industry, we were very much looking forward to the seed treatments because there is no spray. Um, and of course, the learning curve on adapting to seed treatments and then eventually the long-term experience of them. Um, overall, on the, on the net benefit risk scale, they're definitely a, a very strong positive on the benefit side compared to, to the risks of say uh, aerial or boom spraying. That, that's typically done. But as Heather mentioned, these are complex events often combined uh, with other chemicals. And so the net effect of, or the toxicity of being combined with other chemicals uh, is called the tank mix of you know, whatever um, can, can lead to unknown outcomes to the, to the surrounding environment. Hmm. Does that answer your question? That was really helpful, thank you. Thank you very much. We, we have another question. I don't know whether you want to take it now or you want to take it um, later, David. Maybe we, maybe we could hold off to the end because we're so close okay. to the end, okay. if you wouldn't Great. mind. Great, okay. So basically, we're, we're in this system where humanity is still moving things around. Um, and it's, it's not just um, agriculture, but it's anything to do with the natural world. And we're constantly introducing uh, invasive species. 
biosecurity is a huge part of some countries. For example, New Zealand have a very intensive uh, biosecurity program. And just to give you an example, so many of their birds became ground nesting that when Europeans showed up and brought their house cats with them, it was like, you know, giving me a bowl of popcorn as far as the cats were concerned. All these ground nesting birds were just readily available for munching on and they had no natural defenses. And of course, once they're established, then what do you do with it? You know, you, you can't convince people to get rid of their cats, but you know, that's just an example that people can understand. Um, but the world is moving more and more to uh, a mixing of everything and what will end up thriving uh, in an ecosystem um, will, will end up uh, what, what is there. Um, so when it comes to the beekeeping itself, um, when these varroa mites first came out uh, was at the time that I was the president of the Ontario Beekeepers Association and involved with the executive before that. And essentially, I would go from a meeting with, say, a, a chemical company. I don't want to name anyone, but the chemical company and say, your pesticides are killing our bees. What are you going to do for us? And, you know, we'd have our discussion. And then literally, I'd go down the hallway to a different director of the same company and say, our bees are being attacked by varroa mites. What have you got for us? You know, so these, these, you know, to say a, a you know, a pesticide is a blanket statement is bad is not correct because we use pesticides within the beekeeping industry for controlling our issues. The thing is, the beekeeping are a very small industry, and chemical companies have very little interest in investing in sustainable products. So. Um, we were looking uh, for a product. What happens is with the conventional products, the, parrot, the pests typically develop resistance to them because of, of mechanisms internally. The survivors, of course, start to, of, of the pesticide treatment start to breed and then the, the, the next generations become more and more resistant to these chemicals. So the beekeeping community was looking for sustainable tools and management practices. So that's, the company that I'm involved in is called Nod Apiary Products, and the Nod stands for Nature's Own Design. And so we looked at what nature does to protect itself. And so if you ever want to watch an interesting video, you can, uh, it's called anting. And this is where birds go and stir up an ant's nest to cause these ants to spray formic acid into their feathers to drop off the tests, the, the ticks and pests that are bothering the bees. Um, so, we're looking for these sustainable tools that nature's already using. So what you see in the picture before you is, um, is a product that we developed where all the components are completely compostable. Uh, they uh, typically uh, pesticides uh, for use in beehives have come in plastic impregnated strips, and then you have to dispose of those strips in a certain way. But we, what we developed was a saccharide gel matrix with a special wicking uh, coating surface on them that allows for the release of formic acid into the beehive over an extended period of time. And then once those strips are spent, then they can simply be composted. And because the mode of action is one that uh, is highly unlikely for the, uh, for the pests to develop a resistance to, it's seen as sustainable. And we've had this product tested by other scientists on other mites, such as tropical laylapse mite or tracheal mites. And it's, uh, it's the best performing product in the world at the moment against those other, other pests. So we see a very bright future for beekeeping as long as we can give beekeepers the tools they need to have sustainable uh, management practices. The other thing we'd like humanity to, to focus on is this whole idea of habitat recovery and management for native species. Because when humanity does that, it not only helps uh, other wildlife, not just insects, but other habitats. Um, I've been involved with uh, um, migratory animal corridors where, of course, before people were here, uh, nature had uh, a lot of migratory animals and they need corridors to move. Uh, probably the most famous insect one is the monarch butterfly, which uh, you know goes back and forth uh, across the continent, north to south. Um, but they need places to, 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 to feed and, and to be and to raise their young. 
And so we encourage uh, management of habitat recovery and creating green zones um, for all species. And then just to note that pollination as a proportion of economic contribution is going to continue to grow. And beekeeping is one of the few farm practices that's likely to remain nomadic because we can pick up our colonies, take them different places. Um, a lot of beekeepers in the US, they don't even want a honey crop. They just, they raise bees, they, uh, they spend a lot of their life in hotel rooms <laughs> and they move from crop to crop. And then for the winter, they might have a home base. Um, but it's, it's one of the few growing nomadic lifestyles in the world. Same with Australia, actually. There's a lot of nomadic uh, beekeepers in Australia. The other thing is, it's just at a very personal level, um, because of the urbanization of our population, there's, people are starting to feel a disconnect with their food. What they come across in the grocery store is very sanitized. It's, you know, it's all wrapped in plastic. They don't see the animal that a particular cut of meat may have come from. It's just, it's, it's not very personal. So we're seeing that there's a lot of interest people have in reconnecting with their food. So um, there's been a huge uptick in uh, urban beekeeping. And another thing that's interesting with honeybees is you can start out with one or two colonies and then you get continue to be more interested and then you have 10 colonies and then even, maybe even more interested and you've got 100 colonies. Anything up to 200 colonies is called the sideline beekeeper. Anything over 200 colonies is considered commercial beekeeping because it becomes a significant portion of your income. So here you have something where you don't require the expense of land, where you rely on the goodwill of others, or maybe for a case of honey or two, you're allowed to put uh, bees on someone else's property. So it's a landless form of agriculture. And you can, you know, this is, this is common. The other thing that's of interest is a lot of women have taken up an interest in beekeeping, which is actually a reversion before movable frame hives in the industrialization of beekeeping, Bees were considered often the women's work was part of the family garden. They were encouraged to go out and capture swarms if swarms happened. And then when it came down to harvesting the honey, they would burn sulfur and then set the, the hive over the sulfur and kill off the bees. And then they'd be the ones to harvest and render the wax and, and get the honey. Um, now, um, I had the experience of going to Jordan and uh, with my son-in-law and speaking, spending some time with the beekeepers. And often in the room, the only women would be um, my wife, Mary, if she was with me, and perhaps the wife of another speaker that might be there, but we were, those would be the only two women. And afterwards, we would uh, you know, say go out for a meal or something with the, bee, the leaders of the beekeeping community. So I'd ask a question and something like, what are, the, what are the five major challenges facing the beekeeping industry? And one of the ones that came out was that there's a huge interest from females in learning how to become beekeepers, but there's the cultural challenge of how to educate them. So the, the, the male leaders in the beekeeping community were struggling with how to, to teach women that want to learn how to become beekeepers in their own backyards, how, how to pick up, pick up the skills. That was one of the top five questions. Another one that uh, happens is people often don't want to go to an institution of higher learning like a college or a university to learn something which might be a hobby. So there's been a lot of interest in having uh, smaller education centers where mentors can be present to help people learn the skills of how to become a beekeeper. Because the profession itself, your task changes every two to three weeks. So the skill set is widely varied. And, uh, and the tools required is varied. So it, it takes approximately two years for someone to fully become competent in how to do the basic beekeeping skills. And the other thing that's of interest is people have a yearning for you know, the times of the past. And so the picture that you see there is, is a chest style hive uh, where bees uh, may have been kept in the past. Well, there's been a resurgence in using historical styles of bee designs. And we're asked to, you know, how can our product treat hives in these designs? And we've tested a couple of distance designs. It's a real challenge because they weren't designed with the bee space in mind, many of them. And, uh, and yet people have an expectation that uh, what they want to do, they should be able to do. So it's a bit of a challenge. And the other thing that's come up is, is 
humanity loves rules. <laughs> and when we all lived out sort of on our own farm and lived our own lives, there would be social constraints, but a lot of the activities weren't regulated. But now things are highly regulated and innovation is, is a challenge. And I, in my own company, I have two full-time people where all they do is deal with regulatory matters. It's just um, trying to keep on the right side of everything from a regulatory perspective is a real challenge. So again, from a personal story, I had the opportunity to go to Sardinia, which is a large island off the coast of Italy. And uh, if you ever go as a beekeeper, you see the, the real life of the people. It's, it's all back roads. It's, um, you know, you're in farmer's kitchens. It's not at all uh, a tourism type experience. So uh, for people that don't know the history of, of Sardinia, it was sort of a, a cast off island, you know, home of political prisoners and a whole bunch of other sort of things. The coastline is absolutely gorgeous. It's a playground of the rich, but internally up in the mountain, it's a totally different culture. And so I got to, to sit with these beekeepers and ask them, you know, how, how they were dealing with their lives. And they, they were not looking forward to being part of the European Union because of regulatory rules. They, they live very much in a, almost a cashless society where, you know, you might grow grapes and have a pig or two and some goats and I've got honeybees and and grow wine and everyone for example if you wanted to slaughter a hog then you would just clean an area in your in your back shed and take care of it but when they joined um, the European Union suddenly none of this was any longer acceptable you couldn't make your own cheese you couldn't do your own wine you could not if you wanted to sell anything anything that had trade and so they their challenge as farmers was their entire lifestyle of um, living close to the earth was being challenged because of uh, they needed permission to do anything. They needed some sort of authority figure to tell it was okay. And I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm just saying it's the reality of our future is um, we're living more and more siloed lives. You may have to get an electrician to change a light bulb. Um, you know, these are the sort of things that uh, the that direction that humanity is heading. So then we thought we just throw in a bit of honeybee factoids just for fun to wrap up. Um, there's a honeybees have used to become uh, for fencing elephants because elephants recognize the risks of honeybees. And so uh, honeybee colonies have been spread around where fences have failed and they put honeybee colonies out. They can use it to keep elephants out of crops that otherwise may have been trampled. Another thing that honeybees have been used for in the past is, is in warfare, where uh, a defending people would, from above, throw honeybee colonies down on invading armies to discourage them, <laughs> of course, due to the stinging. Another thing um, is recently I've sat through talks where uh, honeybees have been trained for landmine detection by using radar you could uh, do as, as, as Heather talked about, train honeybees to recognize certain things with a positive experience. They would release these bees over an area where landmines were planted and they could 100% accurately determine where these landmines were because they, they would form a cloud of bees around them. Um, so that's just another thing that's been done with, with bees. Another long-term thing with bees is, is using apotherapy which if you have say a rheumatoid arthritis or joint pain, you might go and ask your local beekeeper for a sting. And that could, uh, the swelling would be intense, but the increased circulation could relieve some of the pain. Um, and then of course, bee pollen, uh, people are collecting that now as a source of, uh, of protein for people where they can take it as a vitamin supplement because it contains all the vitamins and minerals we're known to need. So that's a new harvest from the colony, special traps put on the front of them. There we go. All right. Shall I go ahead, Dawn? Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, go ahead, Winnie, you're next. Okay. Um, 
I want to go back to climate change, and I think uh, uh, Mark Griffin also had a question about it. Some time ago, a beekeeper told me a fact that I wonder, is it is it verified that um, the bees, and I would assume this is the wild population, had migrated 200 miles north from the Gulf. Um, is there a migratory thing happening with bees um, that, that are in the environment? And then um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that my husband's grandfather used to capture the bees and have his wife open the can on his back for that very thing you talked about of apitherapy, and that would have been back in the 1800s. So I can speak to the migration question just briefly. So honeybees, Western honeybees don't migrate, individual colonies don't migrate, they find a place and they, they stay there. When they swarm and they split, then the daughter colonies will go elsewhere. But there are other species of honeybees. So there are about 10 species of honeybees. It depends on kind of which authority you ask. Um, and all the other species are not native to here either. They all live in Asia and Africa. There are other species that actually live their whole lives, not in a permanent location, and they migrate all the time. Um, now, is climate change causing bees to migrate? One thing that climate change is doing, I sort of alluded to it very briefly. I said that in the northern climates, our bees are nicer. Uh, probably most of you have heard of killer bees or Africanized honeybees. So this was a hybrid that we created. We actually created them to be disease resistant. Uh, we hybridized two subspecies of Western honeybees, one of them native to Africa. They tend to be really tough. And we thought, well, this is a good idea. We can make tougher bees by doing this. And there was, there was actually an accidental release in South America. And these bees, which are really tough, escaped. And these are hybrids. Uh, but the other thing that went along with them being really tough and disease resistant is that they're very aggressive or much more aggressive than our, our domestic honeybees. The downside to the fact that they originated partially in Africa is that they're not adapted to live in the cold. So killer bees, uh, which to be fair, in parts of South America, they actually just raise these bees as, as honeybees now. They have given up on trying to eradicate them. Um, and killer is a little bit of a misnomer. I actually worked with these bees in California and, and, and they were sort of fine as long as you wore protective equipment. They're a little bit more defensive, but they aren't, they aren't orders of magnitude worse than, than regular honeybees. Um, but killer, but these uh, Africanized honeybees, which is the, sort of their official name, only extend to about, or at least historically, only extended to about the middle of California. And that's about the, as, as high as they would live. But as the climate is changing, we're now discovering them up into, on the West Coast, up into Vancouver area. So they're moving up. So that is, it's not exactly migration in the traditional biological sense, but the range of, of Africanized honeybees is expanding because the climate is warming. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, so we have, um, let's see, another question here was, uh, Joan Sabo in, in the chat asked how reliable or ac accurate is the organic label on honey given the wide range that bees are able to forage? I'll let you take that one, David. Sure. So there are organic certifying bodies. There are some that will certify organic management practices. And for example, our product is registered as one that can be used um, for organic management practices. But the actual source of nectar um, as the honey itself, um, that poses a challenge. You'd have to be in countries that don't use anything that's not. For example, for me to be certified organic honey here in Ontario, I'd have to stay at least three miles away from any pressure treated wood which when you consider how many backyard decks are made with pressure treated wood, whether they're in a, in a farm household or whether they're in an urban environment, it's essentially impossible to, to meet those kind of standards. So 
depends what you're looking for in the honey. If you're thinking, you know, you're, if you're supporting organic beekeeping practices, then, you know, you would, you would hopefully find a label that's reflective of that. And uh, uh, the agency we use is actually based out of New Zealand. It has a global reach. Um, but because of the Manuka honey that's based in New Zealand, that was a common question. Um, here in North America, if you found honey that was uh, from the rainforest of Brazil, or if you could identify the sources of that, then you're far more likely that it would be an organic honey uh, in the sense of, um, uh, of the co common terminology. Of course, all honey is organic because it's got a carbon molecule in it. Uh, as far as the pure scientific sense, but in terms of, of practices, um, you know, I guess you'd have to be a buyer beware. Charlie has a question from Charles. Charles is muted. I'm happy to take the question. Okay. Yes. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, Charles here from Uganda, East Africa. And uh, yeah, I first of all want to thank uh, you, Heather and David for the wonderful presentation. Um, yeah, I'm Charles and uh, I found uh, a charity organization, but being in Africa and specifically East Africa, I have also lived on seeing uh, or watching over the bees and still in our gardens, we used to have um, what I could call wild bees and these bees uh, lived so much in big uh, trees. And it's really so interesting. And one reason as to why I want to really thank this initiative to come up with such discussions that really uh, try to also think about these kinds of bees that are really super important to us as individuals and to also uh, uh, to everyone in the global system. Yeah, you just can't imagine how uh, social these bees can be uh, if only human beings could learn from them, to be honest, uh, this world would be a, a better place. And from, um, from a biological point of view, you realize these bees are more of, you know, productive than being dangerous. Uh, for me, in my findings along the way, I've really even failed to see any disadvantage that is so connected to the bees. Sometimes people say bees really sting, but to be honest, a real bee will never sting if you're not hurting it, yeah? It will only be dangerous when it hears the smell of a friend being killed. That is when it will become disastrous to anyone. Other than that, a bee is a very social insect, very, very important. For example, in the African, uh, in Uganda specifically, we rely so much on agriculture and you realize most of the crops are pollinated, uh, pollination takes place because of these bees. As we saw in the illustration from Madame Hitha, I think, we very well saw that um, the stigma where pollination takes place is way up than uh, the anther heads, yeah? So it is the work of the bee to get the pollen grain from the anther heads to the stigma that is up. So this means there is no way, uh, in some instances, there is no way that um, maybe due to natural cause or anything else, that uh, these anther heads will get, uh, sorry, the pollen grain will, will move from the anther heads that are down to the stigma. So this is how really important uh, the bee is, that it reaches a point of transferring uh, the pollen grains, uh, which are from the anther heads that are down to the stigma that is uh, a little higher in height. 
So it is really super, super important that we open up uh, such discussions that at some point also maybe try to implement uh, what we try to talk about, for example, here in, in, in these kinds of meetings. So um, I just wanna applaud each and everyone who came up with this initiative to sensitize about uh, the bees and how I wish uh, mm -hmm. so many people and of course also uh, the young generation gets engaged in such topics that are really super important because we realize if we don't open up now, if we don't open up such kinds of talks now, then the future really has uh, nothing much that it is relying on. Yeah, so uh, thank you everyone. And uh, uh, I remain Charles and I hope and pray that I always uh, join such kinds of meetings. Thank you so much. Thank you for attending. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. We just have one more question. I think then, then we'll need to end. Uh, Jacqueline? Hi, so if I understand correctly, it's a formic, uh, I don't know if I got the acid name correctly, that is put into these compostable pads, which are then used in the hives to get rid of the mites, correct? So where, where does one get these pads? <laughs> um, cost etc would be nice to have like a contact to know about it you know and i of course i'm sure there's a specific time to use them etc cetera, etc cetera. where does someone get all that information so we have a website you can google that we're in 23 countries in europe where we've been in new zealand uh 12 years, I think it is now, um, US and Canada with their products since 2005. Um, it's, it's basically, we're, we're taking it to the global beekeeping community as we can afford to do so. Uh, none of this is, is cheap. <laughs> In Europe, it's a veterinary medicine, so we have to run it through all the standards required to meet a veterinary medicine. In North America, New Zealand, it's registered as a pesticide because they have a different approach to it. In, it's under Health Canada in Canada and under the US EPA in the US. And then each state also has their own review of it. So basically, if you go to our website, if it's available in your country, then there's a list of distributors. Is that beekeepers.com? What is the uh, website? Oh, no, it's Nod Apiary Products. Nod, N O D. It okay. stands for na Nature's Own Design. Okay. I think it's actually I think it's actually nodglobal.com. Thank you. Okay, Nod me, Global. If I reshare my screen here, the the website is on there. So let me just. Okay, and it would be interesting to know how that is actually collected from the ants. <laughs> Maybe oh, they'll. Maybe they share that information on there too. <laughs> we, we don't collect it from the ants. There, there are producers of, formic acid is a relatively simple molecule. So there oh. are commercial producers of formic acid. Thank you. Well, formic acid itself is a relatively recently discovered molecule, um, but it is it now has a lot of uses, including in food. And just so you know, if you ever drink a cup of coffee, you're drinking formic acid because it's a component of coffee <laughs> and, and many other fruits and vegetables. It's a, it is the base uh, carboxylic molecule and it's, it's in most of what we eat from the natural environment. Uh, but the name um, formic acid is actually because it's named after the ants, formica ants. And uh, that's, that's when it was first observed. And so it's a colloquial name. It's not a scientific name. I, I think we didn't even mention that actually formic acid is a natural component of honey anyway. So it's something that's already found inside the colony. Oh. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's, it's been so interesting to hear all of this. 
and I'm sure there are going to be plenty of discussions and questions after uh, after we leave here today. Um, I want to thank our presenters, Heather and David, for um, sharing this information with us, um, and hopefully. Um, You'll join us next month. We meet at the, the last Sunday of every month at one o'clock. And um, thank you all for uh, being here today. Thank, thank you so much for having us. Uh, hopefully it wasn't too much. <laughs> no, no, it was wonderful. wonderful. Yes, thank, thank you. you for having us. That was very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. Don? Well, yes. Well, Will this be on our list of YouTubes eventually? It will. Okay. Yes. So people yes. can go to the uh, invitation that they got and they'll see past ones of right. past programs. Right. And also on that invitation, if you receive that invitation, is the link to our subscribe page. So you can go to that page and subscribe and get on the list and hear um, about our uh, future presentations. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.